Titus chapter 2. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged woman likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young woman to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young man likewise, exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he is that of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, no purloining, but showing all good fidelity, that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us for all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you've done for this church, and please uh, give Brother Josh the blessing to preach an encouraging message. Thank you. Amen. 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 Well, if I was going to teach an exhortation message, now I can. I have to teach an encouraging message. If I go. Brother's prayer there. Thank you very much for reading that. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I'm going to talk about today reverence and responsibility. Reverence and responsibility. <clears throat> reverence simply means a deep respect for someone or something. Uh, reverence is lifted up almost on par with the idea of, of fear. Some people take fear. When it says, fear the Lord, and they'll, they'll say, the liberal mind will say, oh, you shouldn't fear God. You should never fear Him. Well, yeah, you should fear Him. Fear is like a higher level of respect, and that's what reverence often ties into. The Bible says of God in one place, it says, holy and reverent art thou. And so what really burns me is when somebody down upon this earth will take that term reverend and apply it to themselves. I am reverend Joshua. Hey, that's wicked. That, that's wrong. That, that term is, is an elevated term, and it belongs only unto God. Reverend God is reverence towards him. That deep respect, even a fear for him, is what we need to give unto him alone. But the idea of reverence also applies within the Christian's life. And I'm talking about reverence and responsibility today and how these two intermingle and work together. So you can keep your finger, keep your place anyways, uh, in Titus chapter 2. I'm going to go to Ephesians in chapter 6. The first thing that I want to talk about is specifically reverence. And in regard to reverence, how it applies to children or the younger as unto they must put their reverence toward the elder or their parents. Children need to have reverence for their parents in this day and age. And we are living in a time, the Bible says, Woe unto you when the, the women and the children shall rule over you. You'll read that in the book of Isaiah. I, of course, paraphrase that. But we're living in such a time where that is the case, where the children lead the house. Whatever little Johnny wants, Johnny gets. Whatever little Johnny wants to do, Johnny gets. Whatever little Johnny wants, does. He's crying, he's on the ground kicking and screaming. Just give him whatever he wants to keep him quiet. He's ruling the house these days, and these things ought not so to be. Amen. That little Johnny should have reverence for his parents. He is subservient to his parents in the order of things. Ephesians chapter 6 says this in verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. 
Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. That statement comes out and hits you like a ton of bricks, eh? Children, obey your parents. Children, obey your parents. What does obey mean? Obey doesn't just mean, you know, your, your mom or your dad asks you to do something and after 20 seconds you finally do it or after you, you fight back and you say, well, why should I? I don't want to. I have this other thing to do. No, obey means do it right now as soon as it's asked. Obedience is, yes, doing what is right, but it's doing it right away. As soon as it's asked. The first time children are to obey their parents. And not just when things are asked specifically, but if your mom gave you a command last week to clean up your dirty socks off the floor, that command still applies today. Clean up your dirty socks off the floor. Obey. Don't even let them touch it, right? That idea of obedience is paramount to the Christian life, and we need to start learning it at a younger and younger age. And therefore, children, obey your parents. This isn't a suggestion. This is a command from the Word of God. You can't get away with it, children. But again, parents, that applies to us that are even older, right? We need to obey our parents. We need to have honor for thy father and mother. And that's verse 2 and what that describes. It says, honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Then it says this, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long in the earth. That is pointing back to when it says the first commandment with promise, way back in Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 is what we know as the Ten Commandments these days. So, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Nestled in with all of those commandments is this one, and it says of it in Ephesians chapter 6, that this is the first commandment with promise. Verse 12 of Exodus chapter 20. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So this is a command, yes, but it comes with a promise. What a wonderful thing. Quite often God, is he's in the business because he's the boss, because he's the ruler, creator, master of the entire universe, of just saying, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. He's always giving us commands, but this is the first command we find recorded in the Bible that he attaches a promise to. Isn't it great when God not only asks you, commands you, charges you to do something, but he gives you a promise associated with it as well? If you obey, if you do it right away, God gives the promise of this. He says that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God Giveth thee. Look for the gray-haired person. Look for the really aged and healthy man. Look for the woman that is out there and she looks like she's in her 90s, but she's zipping around in the grocery store. The older man that can still lift heavier things than you can. And he's got gray heads and most of the time he walks with a cane. If you ask somebody like that, what's the secret to living long? They might have their, their diet. They may have their exercise. They may have the list of all the things that they've done and maybe perceived in their mind that this helped them. But if you dig a little bit deeper and say, did, did you honor your parents? They'll probably affirm to you, yeah, I did. I, I loved my parents. I respected my parents. I always looked up to them. They were great family to me. More important than that, they were great friends to me. I, I love my parents. I, I, I still think about them each and every day. They're going to have great reverence and respect for their parents, the one that has lived long in the land, and it may be well with them. You're going to find that quite often with really aged people. And that's what the promise is here. If you, are going to, if you would honor your parents, children, if you would have the promise of long life and a well life, a good life, a comfort in your life because of it. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great that God would offer that gift for your obedience? When he has every right to just demand the obedience in the first place. He's the, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He can do as he will among the children of men. The next one that I want to focus in on is we've just talked about children towards parents, and that is good and well. We all understand who our parents are and who, how we need to have reverence for them, do what they say, obey, which means to do it right away, and that's well and good. What about, though, the children, or even, let's grab this, the younger, turn to Leviticus chapter 19, the children, or even the younger, how are they to deal with, interact with, treat the elder of them? Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus chapter 19, explains 
this. It says Leviticus 19 and verse 32. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. I love when God does this. He just reminds you that as he's giving you these commands, just like in Leviticus chapter 19 throughout the whole Bible, you'll find that same statement in verse 10 and verse 4 and verse 3 and verse 2 and verse 14 and verse 16 and verse 18. He'll give you the command and then he'll say, I'm the Lord. So that again points back to that idea that, hey, God can do what he wants. So the promise that he gives, those that show reverence to their elders, those that show reverence to their families, their parents in the context of this, uh, show, he's just reminding you that, hey, I can do what I want, but I choose to give you children a gift of long life and a gift of wellness if you obey me in this area. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32 specifically, though, addresses not just the child to their parents, but even a child unto any adult and to anyone older than them. This is pointing all the way up to the oldest of men, the hoary head. Hoary is simply a, a, an older term for white. The one with the white hair, right? Too often what we do in this nation and in this time is we take the person with the white hair and we shove them in a home where we don't have to see them. Where we put them away where we don't have to deal with them. And we, we shove them away and then the kids just visit sometimes on Christmas. No, the Bible prescribes that the hoary head is to be, felt, is to be found and, and kept in honor. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. Do you know what that means? When an elderly push person walks into the room, children, stand up. Thou shalt rise up before them. Stand up, you know, straighten yourself out. Be polite, be courteous, show respect for the elderly. Show respect for the person who is of a hoary head, who is aged. The Bible says here, it says, honor the face of the old man and fear the glory right? And fear thy God, right? He connects the uh, same idea. And I think what he's trying to describe here is that your level of respect for the aged and the hoary head and the person that is older than you goes hand in hand with the level of fear that you have for your God. You need to respect them essentially as if they were your God. You need to have that same amount of reverence for them. You're sitting in the bus and an aged woman walks on like this and there's no spots. You ought to be the first one to get up off your seat and let them sit down. That's all children, and that's even all for young adults. We ought to be, as Christians, the first one to rise up before the hoary head and allow them to take your place. What is this? What is this teaching us? What, why would we do these such things? This is teaching you lifelong lessons in the Christian life about how to deal with people that are your elder. Believe it or not, some people know more than you, especially somebody who's of a hoary head, who's been a, around this world, and yeah, they might not be Christian, and they might not be saved, but they probably got more wisdom in their little finger than you have in your entire body, especially you youngins, right? And that's the problem, though, is that in our generations, especially once kids become uh, young adults, and then they become teenagers, and then they start to grow up, their heads get like this big, and they think that they know it all. My two-year-old's already doing this to me. He thinks he knows everything. He thinks he can figure things out. He's going to do everything on his own. But the Bible says that the solution for that is uh, the right amount of respect be instilled into children that they would point it towards those that are older than them. The authorities in their life are their, ch are their parents. Children, respect your parents. Have reverence for your parents. Obey your parents in the Lord. Why? For this is right. This is the right thing to do. Right? In the same time, he says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. So this transcends just children towards their parents. This transcends that and gives you the next steps to that. When the child learns to have reverence for their parents, then they, when they become, uh, you know, toddlers, when they become children, when they become uh, teenagers, young adults, they are going to transmit that same respect that they had for their parents into anyone who is older than them because they have been taught rightly that they are to hold them and esteem them higher than themselves. It's just right mentality. And that's why God says, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. He doesn't have to give you any reasoning why. He's the Lord. He says, this is right. This is what I said. Do it. But what a blessing when God takes that and gives you a promise. Hey, if you do such things, you have the promise that I will live, let you live long. I will make things well for you. Rise up before the hoary head. Have them in honor. Fear 
thy God. I am the Lord. He commands here. He charges here. So this is a serious issue for children. This isn't just something we can just sort of pass over. Most of the commands that you'll find in regard to children in the Bible, and most of the ideas that you'll find in regard to people that are younger than people that are older, involves reverence and respect. It involves showing the appropriate amount of respect for somebody who's lived longer than you, somebody who knows a little bit more than you, and you don't know more than your parents, and your parents have the direct authority over you. Yes, that old man that you let sit in your chair, he has no authority over you, right? But you should show that same respect that you've learned by reverencing your parents unto every elder that would come by your path. And that is right. Those same principles carry over into every aspect of your life. Kill kids. Do you want a well life? Do you want a long life? Do you want to have a full life in this world? You need to take hold of that promise and that promise comes by obeying your parents and it comes by having respect for the elders in your life. Show yourself right unto God. Please the Lord. And that is what he wants you to do in these situations. He wants you to Live the way he commands that you live. Give you blessings because of it. And then, therefore, you, you just become the one that has that full and has that long life. This is a precedent, again, that's going to carry over into all aspects of your life. Proverbs chapter 20, if you would. Proverbs chapter 20. Right in the middle of your Bible, you'll find, find Psalms. Right after that is Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20. <clears throat> So that's the most important thing about these, these teachings that you can grasp a hold of when you're just a little kid, like reverencing your parents, respecting your parents, obeying your parents, the, the, the commandments that a young mind can get a hold of. The most important thing about these is that they set a precedent for the rest of your life. It makes it so that when you grow up, you're not going to be like these millennials and be a bunch of spoiled, rotten brats that can't be told they're wrong. They can't be corrected. They can't be rebuked. That are really good for nothing. I mean, I work in a factory, and we we find 20 people come in uh, on hiring day on Monday, and by Friday, 20 people are gone out. Why? Because somebody told them you need to work faster, and they're like, I quit. That hurt my feelings. You need to show up on time. I'm offended. How how dare you? You need to stay for the entirety of your shift. Ten hours? Are you kidding? I can't work ten hours. I gotta play video games. And these are like 20-somethings. But you know when that started? That mentality started in these kids' lives. And they're, they're honestly, I'm not, I'm not trying to be offensive or hurtful. Those young adults that are coming out and coming into my family, they are good for nothing in the work world. They are, they are, you can't get anything out of them. And you know when it started? It started when they, their, their parents like, neglected them and the word of God was not preached and nobody was teaching the generations after the proper way of respecting their parents, yes, and obeying their parents, which teaches them to have respect for the elders and has respect for the people that are over them. And then they get into the real world and suddenly somebody says, you're not so good at your job. And they're like, that hurt my feelings. People need to be, have, have harder, um, they need to have uh, more backbone. This is, this is a problem. I see it every day. I see it all the time. And it drives me nuts that people can't be corrected. My wife tells me that sometimes she thinks my boss is too hard on me, and I just embrace it. I say, well, if, if I'm not told what I'm doing wrong, then how can I fix it? And my boss is always telling me, you need to think. You're, you're being an idiot. What are you doing? It sounds really harsh, but when I go to my job and I'm trying to excel and do the best I can, when he takes my document that I worked really hard on, and he colors all over it with red and said, this is terrible, and then just walks away. When I fix it, I've learned something. When I bring it back to him, he's like, good job. And that's the biggest thing is to get a good job from a boss that just told you you're an idiot. <laughs> he just told you you need to think. He just told you, I, what do I pay you for? I pay you to think. And I'm like, yes, sir, I'll do better. The only reason that I am at a position in my life whereby I can listen to an authority, this is by the grace of God, God teaches me these things, but I grew up in a household where I had to have the proper respect and reverence and obedience towards my parents. Yeah, I was rebellious. Yeah, I didn't always agree with them. Yeah, I got a few swats and a few licks. Yeah, I was corrected. I was rebuked. I was grounded. They had everything thrown at me that they could do to kind of correct me and to guide me. When I came out on the other end, I wasn't a spoiled, rotten brat. I was somebody that was teachable. And that's the most important thing that you can be as a Christian, to be teachable. Because I'm going to stand up here one day, and I'm going to say something that is wrong. And I'm going to go home, and God's going to say, ah, that was wrong. And I'm going to see it and go, yep, 
Yep, that's right. My heart will repent. I will get it right in my mind. And I will come up and I will say, look, I was wrong about this. I will be, te- I'll be taught something because I had a teachable spirit. And if you're not teachable, you're going to get full of yourself. You're all puffed up with pride. Next thing you know, even God can't tell you you're wrong. True. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 11 says, Even a child, even a child is known by his doings whether his work be pure and whether it be right. So it's very clear that even a child, you can look at their works and understand if it's pure and if it's right. This tells me that a child can make righteous judgments. A child can do right by the Lord. He can receive correction. He can receive rebuke. He can receive what God has for him in regard to the scriptures and act it out in a correct way. Remember he said, obey your parents for this is right. Well, hey children, even your doings can be seen whether they are pure or whether they are right. We can understand that. So children aren't exempt from keeping the laws of God. Children aren't exempt from following the statutes and judgments and principles in scripture because even their works can be tried. Even their works can be judged. We can look upon them and see whether they are pure and whether they are right. Kids, you want to be pure and you want to be right in the eyes of God. That is the most important thing. Again, you're not always going to agree with your boss. You're not always going to agree with your parents. You are not always going to agree with the authorities that are over top of you. But God said it's right that you obey them anyway. And that is what's right in his world. And if you are pleasing to God and obey your parents, which is proper, and that transmits to obeying elders in your life, and that transmits to following what your boss tells you to do and just just doing it because he has commanded you and you have that obedient teaching heart, the world will look upon you. Your, Your family will look upon you. Everyone will behold you and say that his work is pure and his work is right. You can be known by that. That will become typical of what you're defined as. In other words, if you're pure and if you're right in your works, people will think, hey, that's a pure and that's a right child. And they will recognize that in you. And that's such a blessing to have men recognize it, but more importantly, to have God recognize it. You need to be respectful. This is another thing to get respect. Okay? You need to be kind in order to receive kindness. You need to be generous in order to receive gifts. And the principle here is that you reap what you sow. Now, where does this apply to children? Well, when you're a young child and you're building the foundations of your life and you're building upon rebellion, upon uh, talking back, upon doubtful disputations, upon not doing what you're told, when you grow up, don't be, res- don't be surprised when everyone in your life doesn't listen to what you say, is rebelling against your words, is fighting against you, is kicking against you, is just always in disagreement with you. You need to build a foundation of being respectful in order to sow respect. You need to sow respect in order to reap respect. It's just like um, the idea of a, of a seed. I need to sow an orange seed in order to get an orange tree. Okay? You need to sow in your life respect for elders in order that when you're an elder, that tree that grows up is that respect comes for you. You need to sow the seed of kindness into your life so that when you grow up, People are kind to you. That's the tree that sprouts up. You need to sow the seed of being generous, of being um, practically good to people, of being righteous. Sow all those seeds into your life now, children, because you can be known by those doings so that when you are older and you are grown up, those same tendencies come to you. People in your life treat you with respect. People in your life treat you with kindness. People in your life treat you with generosity and all those types of things that you, at a very young age, planted and built a precedent upon in your life. So, children, be obedient because it is right. And what a blessing that God would give you rewards for it. Be obedient. Be respectful. Show honor to elders out of the responsibility to do so, out of the duty because God commanded it. But what a blessing it is when God gives you long life, when he gives you wellness within that long life. It's your choice, though. Do you see that? you see how the Bible always gives you a command, but it gives you the choice of whether or not you do it? God will give you a blessing. You can inherit that blessing, which will be fruitfulness and bountifulness and a well, long life. But you have to choose to obey the word of God. Just like in each and every opportunity, you have to choose to obey your parents. 
You can do everything mom and dad says today and then tomorrow just rebel against it. And, and you, haven't, you haven't canceled it out, but you're setting the precedent that you are an unstable soul. You're someone that is really dependable and kind and compassionate one day, and the next day they're just rotten and rebellious and don't want anything to do with right? So children, this is important. This is important to hear, that you are setting the precedent now in your life for how you are going to live out the rest of your life. And glory to God if he gives you a long one. You want to be able to spend that in wellness. You want to be able to spend that reaping the good things that you've sown when you were a child. You don't want to end up like these millennials. Responsibility, though. This is where I turned around. All the kids are like, man, they're pick he's picking on me today. The responsibility, though, extends, okay? So like I said, this is the precedent that when you're a child, you're obedient, you're respectful, you grow up, and you start to receive that same of yourself. Why have you received that? Well, because you've known what it was like to be the respectful youth and younger, and therefore you know how to retreat the respectful youth and the younger. And you know how to act out and how to live out what needs to happen in order to make the be. Well, what am I talking about? Elders, parents, our responsibility lies within the realm of being somebody that is worthy of that respect. Okay, even if you are not a good parent, even if you are just rotten and disrespectful, whatever, the Bible still commands children obey your parents. In the Lord, for this is right. So a saved child is their responsibility to obey their parents. But in the right world, in the right way, that parent was taught the way that child was taught. And that parent grows up, and they are now somebody because of what they've sown into their lives that is commanding of the respect that they are given. So our responsibility as the elder, our responsibility as the parent, is to be someone worthy of the respect that is given unto them. So practically speaking, children, just some ways that you would give respect to an elder. Some of us don't really maybe understand what that all means. <clears throat> what I would like to instill in us within the church. Now you will find me referring to Rob sometimes just as that. You will find me referring to Yuri just as that. But typically, whether they are older than me or younger than me, my tendency, especially in the context of church, is going to say Brother Rob and Brother Yuri. An adult is going to get a title in front of their name. It can also be Mr. Rob, Mr. Yuri, right? It is giving the proper due respect to them simply because they are older than you. Now, sometimes as an adult, I will just refer to them by their first name. But it doesn't mean as a child you're allowed to come up to me and just say, hey, Josh, hey, Josh, hey, Josh, right? If we are to have the proper reverence that is due to elders, then the proper thing to do, especially in the context of the church, say, hey, Brother Josh, Brother Gander, Mr. Josh, anything like that that shows that as a child I am giving the proper reverence, the proper direction. You are above me, just in age, just in order. I'm not a better whatever than you, but the principle of the scripture is that respect is given to the elder, respect is given to the parents. Now with parents' kids, It'll be mom or it'll be dad or whatever your, your parents have decided would be their title. It is a very disrespectful thing. <laughs> you, you, maybe you've never heard it yet. Right now when Caleb's too, it's kind of funny, right? When he says, hey, Josh. <clears throat> but if he's ever to dress me as, as Josh when, when, he's, when he's much older, that's going to be a great sign of disrespect. Does that make sense? Because I'm given a proper title and a proper order. And it is his responsibility to comply with that. I think once I called my mom by her first name. It didn't go good for me. <laughs> it, because, it, because it shows that I was trying to put myself up on the same level as her. When my position is to be obedient and subservient to my parent, I was basically stepping out of rebellion and saying, whatever, Leanne. <laughs> no, that's not good. That's not right. So to your parents, it's mom and dad. To, to men and women within the church, Brother Rob, Brother Yuri, Brother Samson, right? You just give that proper reverence. And, and that is good and that is right. So we're going to try to practice that here. Next thing is that we can be helpful. And I just talked today about how we're not going to be running in and out of here all the time. But if you notice when you're in here, you'll see the adults are all putting around. We're ordering, organizing chairs. We're putting things away. We're cleaning up. A respectful thing and a proper show of reverence would be, yes, 
okay, in the bus scenario, you get up and let the older person sit down. But in this scenario, it would be, hey, brother, here, you go talk. I'm going to straighten these chairs out. Some of the older kids could get involved. They could help out. They could be courteous. They could be encouraging. They could do all sorts of things and be involved in the ministry around here, especially as we get older and we're approaching manhood. It's good for us, or, or ladyhood, right? It's good for the younger children to start to learn how to keep and to do responsibilities in this area. We need to, bottom line, esteem other better than ourselves. That applies in every realm of the Christian life. So my needs automatically go lower. My, my cares, my worries, what I want is lower than anyone else, and we're to esteem them higher, especially if there's somebody who has an authority over you, especially if there's somebody who is your parent, who is your boss, who is, who is somebody that deserves because of their age or what have you a higher level of honor and respect that is due. Those are just practical ways that we can do that as children, and even as adults. Use proper terminology, use, use titles when you're addressing people, and, and just be courteous, be helpful, be subservient to those that you are under. But again, Proverbs chapter 16, if you would. Proverbs chapter 16. We're getting on to the responsibility side. For those that are receiving the reverence. They ought to show that they're worthy of it. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 31 says, The hoary head, there's that white hair again, right? Is a crown of glory. So it is something that is like, wow, it, it's showing their position. It's showing their age. It's showing their, their esteem that is high, right? It's the crown, if it be found in the way of righteousness. That verse ends. So, so I, I've, I've heard that phrase said many times that there's, 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 there's nothing... Nothing worse, you know, than a, than a stubborn old fool, right? People that are not in the way of righteousness. They're not acting right, though they are, they are old, right? Um, un unfortunately, when we went soul winning last night, um, I'm not accusing these men of everything, but they invited us in, actually. They just said, open the door, right? Because these were older men sitting in their chair and their walker, and so it's kind of weird to just open up someone else's door and walk in. But they, they were not going to hear any kind of gospel preaching. They're not going to hear anything because their mind was already made up by the time they got to that. So they're not in the way of righteousness. They're not going to be saved. They're not going to be born again. It's very unlikely because their mind is made up, especially at the time you get really old. But, and uh, Miss Amanda will testify to this, in those situations, I was very respectful to them, very polite, and saying, hello, and, 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 and what we'd like to give you the opportunity to preach. I wasn't like, what do you mean, you old man? Why would you want to listen to me preach? And that would have been very disrespectful for them. But my voice automatically drops. My respect for the person that is older automatically is heightened. And I say, sir, sir, I, I would love to share with you the gospel if you would. And, I, and I, don't even, I didn't even respond. I didn't even react back when they said no. I said, okay, thank you, sir, for your opportunity. Just close the door behind me. You need to be showing that right amount of respect for those that are aged. But what this principle here is, in, is that the hoary head is that crown of glory if it be found in the way of righteousness. In other words, when you get old, if you're not in the way of righteousness, then, then that, that gray hair really means nothing. Now, to the Christian, it still means you are respectful. To the younger person, it still means that you do what you ought to do. But that person doesn't, doesn't seem worthy of that respect. You give it. But if they're not in the way of righteousness, then th there's no crown of glory. It's not something that's good. It's just, it's just, that's just signifying their age. Okay, <clears throat> So that's the difference here, is that we're still to show the respect, but we also should not be that hoary head. We should not grow aged and not be in the way of righteousness. Our righteousness and our stance with God needs to be just keep on increasing, right? The Bible says that we are being conformed to the image of His Son. What that means is that we are being made into the same image of Christ. So, so as we get closer to that final day, we should actually be more and more and more righteousness and more in line with the principles and the teachings of Christ Himself. But... We all know it to be true that there is nothing more frustrating, trying and pitiful and discouraging than a stubborn old fool. So don't be that younger fool. Like I said, it's still the younger's responsibility to show that reverence, but it's a lot easier when the one being reverenced is mindful of that reverence and is acting out as if they would be worthy of it. Titus chapter 2, we'll go back there. And here are some of the responsibilities. Titus chapter 2. Those that are in a position where they are commanded to receive respect because the Lord put it upon the youngers to give it, need to act and behave, and it's their responsibility to be a vessel fit to receive such an honor. Titus chapter 2 and verse 2, it says that the aged man be sober, grave, temperate, 
sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Okay? So <clears throat> the older person, the older man specifically here, needs to be sober great. They need to be serious. Yes, there's time for kidding around and fooling about. But the general bent of the aged man is to be one of seriousness. Is to be one of almost a stoic idea mentality. They are showing that they are worthy of that type of respect. Somebody is lifting them up and saying, hey, you know, praise the Lord, brother, so-and-so, would you, would you impart unto me some, some wisdom, some sort of thing? They need to be some, somebody that someone would come to and seek after wisdom because they are sober. They're ready to give a sober answer. They're not always kidding around. They're not always fooling around. They're always joking. They're grave. They're sober. Temperate is the next idea here. It says self-restraint. You need to be even keeled as you get older. As you get older, you need to be more stable, not, not turned about with every wind of doctrine, every wind of the world, every care, every need, every trial. You need to be one that is, that is, is showing that temperance, that self-restraint, that even keeled mentality. Sound in faith. This is one that you quite often see in aged people. You see that, you see that great faith. When you go to somebody who's, who's just been war-hardened by many Christian trials, and you look at them and you say, say oh, I'm just going through the hardest thing right now. And they just, they just say, you know, have faith in God. And, and you're like, what in the world? My whole life's falling apart. And that's your advice? Those guys have been through enough. They're sound in their faith. So they're going to take that position of just have faith in God, and they're going to be able to tell you some sort of story that's going to encourage you and reassure the fact that, yeah, they've been through it. They are sound in the faith because they've had their faith trialed. They're steady. They're believing. They're always with that bent, aged men. Charity. They need to be loving. They need to have kindness. They need to have compassion as a major character trait within them. That's how you show you are worthy of the reverence that the younger are commanded to give to you. And patience. Humble to wait. Whether you're waiting on God or you're waiting for people or you're waiting for others. Whatever you're waiting, you're just patient. You're somebody that's not always grasping at, searching for, rushing for that next thing. Aged men need to, need to develop these type of character traits. It's their responsibility to do so. The aged women, likewise, it says that in the next verse. It says that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste keepers at home, and continues. So the aged woman portion is just that of being in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. So that behavior of, of the older lady needs to be one that is always pointing unto holiness. It is always in the direction of holiness. They are just gradually, you look at them and they're, they're more and more righteous every day. They're almost floating next to you because the aged women have come to such a point where they're, they're just prayerful, like loving and wonderful people. I've, I've met some of these aged women who fit this to a key, to a T, and it's like, it's like they're floating. I mean, they're just, they're just on fire for God. Their, their prayer life is vibrant. And their behavior is one that becometh holiness. It creates holiness. It creates an atmosphere of holiness when you're around one of these aged women who are having behavior that is in that direction. They're not false accusers. In other words, they're not ignorant storytellers. They're not going to get caught up in some sort of drama, some sort of story. I've had the same thing in my experience where, where aged women are very even keeled when a story, when a dramatic event, when a when a when a comes around their way, they simply they simply just 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 toss it off, just just ignore it. They're not going to get involved in the stories. They're not going to be a false accuser in that area. Not given to much wine. So the Bible is clear that, that wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging and those that are deceived thereby are not wise. I believe the Bible teaches that, that we should be absent of all alcoholic wine. There shouldn't be any of that touch a Christian's lips. But what it's saying here is not given to much wine. I believe in this context, and most of the context that involves somebody who is, who is an elder, whether it's a church leader or whether it's just an older Christian, it says not given to much wine. What that is referring to is the grape juice type. Now, this time, grape juice would have been a, a prized commodity. You're not going to get you know, a big jug of Welch's grape juice without paying like $1,000 for it just because it was simply not able to keep, not able to have, right? So what it's referring to when it says not given to much wine is that someone, they're not somebody that has expensive taste. They're not somebody who needs the finer things in life because that's what grape juice would have been is a finer thing, something that is, is a, a treat, have you? not something that they're just having much and, and very often. Teachers of good things, aged women, you need to 
be helpful to the younger. You need to be a teacher of all the good things that you've learned in your life as becometh holiness. And this is supposed to transmit, and this is why the aged men and the aged women come, come first. They're at the top of this verse in the, in the totem pole kind of idea. Is in the, I don't even know what you call it. You call it like a, a chain of command, essentially. The top is going to be the aged men as they, as they encourage down and lead about the aged women. As they encourage about and lead the young women and the like wise, the young men have to learn the same things. So, the younger women have reaped the benefits of the ministry of the aged men and women. They have received that same teaching that was passed on. And this is how the world's supposed to work, is that as you get older, you're able to impart knowledge and wisdom unto the younger. And as that wisdom, that direction towards holiness, that idea of being temperate, sound in the faith, patient, having good charity one towards another, it comes down to the younger generations and they start to grow up in those things. And in the same way, the Bible teaches that the young women may be taught of the older women, verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober, right? Same thing, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Women are supposed to learn when they're younger from the elder these things. Being sober. Loving their family. Being discreet. In other words, being separate. Being, being, uh, being, being different than others. Right? They're to be chaste. They're to be uh, one, that, one that has a, a mentality that, that isn't wishy-washy. Right? That isn't um, kind of erratic. They're to be keepers at home, the Bible Prescribes. The Bible defines that the women are to be keepers at home, and they were to learn that from the older generation. They were not to learn to go and be rebels from the older generation. They were not to learn to, to go, go get tatted up and be their own woman and, and get a, get a high-paying job and, and wear pants in the relationship and wear pants in real life. They weren't described to, they were prescribed to do those things, but rather they were to be discreet. They were to be chaste. They were to be keepers at home. Good obedient unto their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. In other words, this mentality that was learned from the older is one that creates a, a scenario whereby if it's not followed, if it's not upkept, cause the word of God to be blasphemed. Well, why would that be? Well, when the biggest generation is your 20s to 40s, and everyone is just just doing their own thing. They're, they're not chased. They're not keepers at home. All the women are running rampant. All the women are just rebels doing their own thing. And, and God is blasphemed because of it. The Word of God is speaking reproachfully because of it. Why? Because there is a select few of people who are observing the teachings of God and they've learned it, maybe not from the elders, but from the principles of the Bible. And they're trying to live by the principles of the Bible. And it's just resulted in God being blasphemed because that's different. That's weird. That's not right. God's wrong. This is the way that women should live. Verse 6 says this. It says, young men likewise. So in the same way that all of these teachings have applied to the aged men, the aged women, the young women, like young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. In all things showing thyself a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. And so that's the fullness of that teaching there. And that's where the word of God is blasphemed because they'll speak against you as if you're evil. They'll say evil things against you. But the Bible says that the young mind, the young men, the young women are to have patterns of good works. In other words, they are just always looked at as a pattern, a repeated process where good works are just coming out of them. Their doctrine is uncorrupt. They're grave. They're sincere. They have sound speech. They cannot be condemned. And those that are of the contrary, the world cannot speak against these things. And it all started because they were taught by the aged women and the aged men who taught the young women and the young men who taught the children, who were obedient unto all these teachers. And this is how you turn around an entire generation, whereby everybody follows the principles and the standards of God, and it becomes goodness and righteousness, which becomes 
goodness and righteousness, which becomes behavior as becometh holiness, and that is always taught to the generation behind them. And look what the end of all this is. I talked about a little bit about how servants, how people in the workplace are just monsters, and they're, 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 they're good for nothing. You can't get a, you can't get a, a, a you know, a, a, a dollar's worth out of them. Exhort servants, verse 9, to be obedient to their own masters, to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloning or, or stealing, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And honestly, that's the end, is that when you step out into this world as a servant, whether you are a wife serving your husband or whether you are the husband serving your boss, you show forth all that good fidelity, you adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. And that is the end of this thing. If I had in my workforce, you know, 20 Christians who were adorning the doctrine of God, I could probably cut my staff in half and get twice as much done. Honestly, that, that's the state that we're living in right now. We have 50 people doing five to 10 good Christian men's jobs. And, and, and it's, it's, it's a struggle, it's a, it's a strife, and it's all because this whole circle of life was not followed, whereby the aged taught the younger, taught the children, the children obeyed, and then they became the younger, which became the elder, who, what did they do? They taught the younger, the aged taught the younger, who taught the children, the children obeyed, right? And then the children became the younger, and that circle of life continues, and that's how it needs to continue in the Christian world. That's how we need to focus our minds and our hearts and be obedient to the statutes that God has given us. Look, if you're an aged man, focus in on these. Do these things. Teach them to the younger. If you're an aged woman, likewise, be in behavior that becometh holiness. Young men, young women, there's commands, there are proper teachings, sound doctrine, things that become sound doctrine contained within the scriptures that we can do and teach the younger generations that they would be the servants of the next generation that would obey those that have the rule over them, that would obey their parents, that would have proper reverence and respect for those above them, adorning the doctrine of God, walking and living the doctrine of God in all things for the grace of God that appeareth that, has, that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. The world needs to see Christians living what's prescribed here in Titus chapter 2. The world needs to see men and women, aged and younger, who accept the responsibility to be an example and to lead and to care about leading and to live the gospel truth, to live the doctrine of God our Savior in all things, literally donning it that it would be seen as we go forth into this whole world, wearing it, making it easier then because I have done what the Bible prescribes as an aged man for the younger men to look up to me and see. That man is righteous. That man is in the way of truth. I'm going to follow after him. Then that young man becomes one that is living righteously, donning, wearing the gospel truth, takes the responsibility seriously to show unto those that are younger than them. And it's easier for the young children to look up to somebody and respect them and to have the proper reverence for them and to be obedient to what they're said. That again, that, that circle, that, that transition of knowledge should pass from generation to generation to generation. And somewhere along the line we fall short. Why? Because just one of those chains needs to be broken off by the deceiver, by the liar, by the Satan of this world, by the way of the world, by the present evil world that we live in, and not enough Christians decided to accept the teaching of verse 12, that we should deny ungodliness and worldly lusts, living soberly and righteously and godly in this present evil world. We need to embrace that. Whatever position we are in, and do right by God, and teach others also, that it would be easier for them to follow in our footsteps. Why? Because God commanded and God prescribed those things. Children, obey your parents, for this is right. But the elders need to don the doctrine of God. They need to wear the doctrine of God. They need to prove to the children that they are somebody that deserves that respect. Though it is commanded within them to keep it, everybody has their proper place, has their proper order, has their proper command, has a proper gift of God. 
We need to just follow what God teaches. That's the only way we're going to turn around a generation is by being what God wants us to be and then teaching others. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, right? Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever command you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. Teach your family. Teach others likewise.